we're back. We're live for the two o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech. And we're talking today about energy in America, but it's really much more than energy in America. It's about Fartzella and uh, also Ascend Analytics and talking about energy in Hawaii, but they, they come from national, in fact, global perspectives. And we have for this discussion, UC Hakanon, uh, Gary Doris and uh, John Robbins. And um, let's see, I want to be sure I get the guy who is with analytics, and that would be Gary. Okay. And UC and John are both from Fartzilla. Right. Um, so, uh, UC, tell us, you know, in general terms, the size and scope of uh, Fartzilla. It's, it's huge, it's global, and it's been around 180 years. And uh, although people in Hawaii may not have heard much of it, it is an enormous company doing enormous things. And in my perception, anyway, it is moving fast um, to deal with global, global development. Yeah. Yeah, Vertila is, uh, like you said, over 180 years old uh, Finnish company originally. And uh, during uh, the last uh, century, Vertila was very strong in shipbuilding, uh, in engines for ships. And since, I would say, the 1980s also grew very strongly into the power plant business. So uh, at, that, uh, at that time, of course, it was quite a lot of business with, I would say, applying the marine engines to, to the power business burning heavy fuel, burning gas, etc. Vertila is about 5 billion, 5 billion euro, 5 billion dollar size company, uh, global really, like you said, Jane. In the marine business, I would say one third of the ships that you see when you go out there, they are surely having Vertila engines on board. And in the power business, we've done close to 75,000 megawatts of power plants around the world. And recently, we have really uh, developed not only products, but also the vision of the company. For example, on the energy business side, we are really having the vision today that we want to lead the world to a decarbonized future. And that may sound funny because we have been selling power plants all, all through the years that burn gas and even oils. But uh, we know that in the future, we have to develop along with the societies and learn to use those fuels that are available. We are also doing battery storage today, etc. Those things that we think will be needed in the future. Yeah, a moment about Finland, you know. Um, it was uh, six or eight months ago, we had uh, some of the the city officials from Helsinki on the show, um, they were really impressive. And they have a thing in Helsinki called Cities as a Service, C-A-A-S. Very successful. And I think it's sort of a, an exemplar of, of how the Finns, you know, are these days. They're, they're global. They're efficient. Uh, they're... They're very advanced. Uh, they're, they're pioneers in so many things. And certainly, uh, Fartzilla has, has uh, done that. I mean, I've seen the pictures of the various uh, ships and, you know, uh, marine, marine uh, well, ships that you make. And uh, they are very advanced. They're all over the world. Every kind of ship, every kind yes. of floating, floating ship you could ever see, uh, they're all there and they're populated everywhere. And from this kind of marine platform, um, you have decided to go into renewables with a vengeance. <laughs> you are really tackling that. Uh, how long ago did that happen? And, you know, it, it sounds like it, it was a bit of a pivot, but a major pivot by a major corporation indicating a major direction by global companies. Uh, can you talk about the decision and how it's been implemented? Yeah, let's say that I would say it started about 15 years ago already when we saw quite a lot of wind power being built in places like Denmark and Germany in, the, in Europe. And we saw how certain challenges emerged then when you started to have enough of wind power in, in the power systems. And, and uh, gradually we started to see that uh, the power systems need to change when you add more and more renewables to those. When you add solar and wind, actually the generation will depend on the weather. Mm -hmm. So when the sun is shining, you get power, but in the night you don't get solar power. And uh, the wind conditions, they also depend on the weather. So we saw that operating those power systems, they will bring new challenges. And the traditional power systems, which typically consist of large centralized, quite inflexible power plants that you start and then you run them 
a year or so, and then you do maintenance. I mean, nuclear, coal, uh, large gas plants, etc. Those were not a good fit when you start to have more and more solar and, and wind power in the system. So a few years ago, we decided really that we changed the changed the vision of the company, like I said, and we have worked now already for 10 years in modeling power systems uh, using really uh, top softwares uh, in a scientific way to understand what would be the optimal way to decarbonize the power system. So this is really a strength of Wärtsilä that even though we are an OEM of engines and power plants and, and, and ship engines and, and storage, we are also extremely interested in understanding the future and modeling the future. And we hope, of course, that by doing that, we would be able to bring forward such technologies, services, software, things that will be needed in, in the future and then uh, maintain our good position in the business. Well, I, I looked at your uh, website. It's, it's very impressive. It's, of course, it's impressive on the marine end, but it's because uh, that's, you know, that was your your calling for, uh, oh, gee. Uh, many years, yeah. Many, 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 still many is. years. And still is, yeah, you're everywhere. Um, but I looked at your energy, uh, the energy side of your website, and that's also very impressive. You're all over the world. You're in 50 countries. You have projects going on everywhere. Um, and what, what touched me was that um, it's not that you have one single system that you drop in a given location. You're always sensitive to what resources are available in that location, uh, what the needs are in that location, or how you can put it together best for that place, um, which I think is really important. And, and it's, that's the secret sauce, as far as I can see. Um, so uh, now you're, when we say that you're the director of growth and development at Varsela Energy, um, is, that, is that a global title? Is that, are you the man you see? <laughs> uh, this is an Americas title. I'm, I'm heading this function for the area of Americas, which is, which is uh, South and North and Central America and Caribbean. So, so this is the title, and uh, this uh, this job uh, contains uh, all these modeling aspects. It contains uh, market development, uh, talking to politicians, etc. It contains the project development activities uh, in the front line and and, and marketing things so it is more or less everything that takes place before we start actually selling things so yeah. this is a kind of uh, peeking into the future and talking to people about the future very much and this kind of stuff it certainly is uh, not only not only in the united states but uh, elsewhere i mean i, I saw your uh, initiative in europe uh, well it's, it's really everywhere but europe has a, a has a green energy program, uh, the EU. That's impressive. Uh, we we talk about that in the US, but I'm not sure we, we can say we have a national <laughs> green energy program just yet. So uh, John Robbins, you are a business development manager at Varsilla Energy. Um, do you do you know UC? Do you get to see him and talk to him once in a while? Uh, not as much lately, um, but uh, I, uh, I live on the West Coast. UC is in Texas. Um, <laughs> So we, we don't cross paths very often, but we do talk from time to time and uh, we see each other a lot on emails, as I'm sure a lot of people do these days. Does the, does the name uh, Georgetown mean anything to you? Georgetown, Georgetown, yeah. Texas. What, what happened there? Uh, well, you know, I was going to I was thinking of Georgetown uh, in Washington, D.C. when you said that. Okay. So I'm afraid I don't know what happened to Georgetown, Texas. Okay. Well, tell me what's going on on your plate. Um, so I'm in the power sector, uh, not the shipping side of our business, but um, what we do, what I do most of my time is work with utilities, work with industrials, um, talking about the technologies that we have, um, both on the engine side of our business, as well as the storage side of our business. And uh, more and more these days, as Jussi mentioned, uh, we're talking to people who want to maximize the amount of renewables that they are using, whether that be solar or wind, uh, and are trying to find a way to make sure their, um, their power systems are reliable. And that's really where our, our technologies come in because they, they really enable both solar and wind to be utilized uh, more widely and adopted uh, in much greater quantities on the grid. 
And um, both of our, our engine technology as well as our storage technology are, are both enablers of renewables. And so, um, you know, it's been pretty exciting, especially for me, somebody who's uh, uh, very much a, uh, a forward thinker in terms of where I want the future to go and how I want the power industry to look. Uh, so for me, it's it's been a real pleasure to work with a technology company that's on the cutting edge of, of helping uh, the whole grid, uh, both in the United States and around the world, modernize and find a way to become much greener and also much more reliable. Um, and you wouldn't think a company that's been around for 180 years would be on the cutting edge like that uh, with technology uh, in our industrial, you know, internal combustion engine technology has, has been around for years, but um, it's, it's extremely well suited for this entire renewables movement. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Now, one of the uh, videos that are, that are uh, on your site, uh, on the Fartzilla site, <laughs> Uh, about energy systems shows uh, three parts. One is a solar field. Um, two is a storage facility connected to the solar field. Mm. And the third is uh, an engine, which I, I found very interesting because that, that supports the system, even if there's no sunlight at the moment, and even if the, ba the batteries are depleted, now, now the, uh, the, the, the engine kicks in, and the engine runs on biofuel or a combination of renewable fuels. It's very interesting. Has that been, has that system been deployed in the U.S.? Uh, it has. Um, it's, it's becoming more and more commonplace. Uh, we're working with utilities in uh, multiple states that are deploying exactly what you described. Uh, and there's even one very close to, uh, to, to your home uh, on Oahu, uh, which I'm sure you know about, um, which was uh, the first Vartzilla plant uh, built in Hawaii in, in over 20 years when it was announced. Uh, back in 2016, we commissioned the uh, project at Schofield Army Barracks, which is owned and operated by Hawaiian Electric. Um, but it was chosen by Hawaiian Electric. Our technology was chosen because uh, they wanted to find a way to maximize the amount of solar, uh, maximize the amount of wind, uh, and make sure that the grid uh, was stable whenever they did that. And they decided the technology that we offer was best suited for that purpose. And uh, ever since 2016, there's been a 50 megawatt plant sitting at a uh, Schofield Army Barracks. Um, many people don't know about it. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't run frequently, but it's there as, as a backup, just in case it's needed, just in case the grid uh, has an issue. Uh, or if the sun suddenly drops when they didn't expect it to, or the wind stops blowing when they didn't expect it to, and there's an immediate need for power, and the grid needs that uh, that resource to kick in, and and that's what it's there for. So um, that's one example. Hey Gary, let's let's turn to you, Gary, just for a minute. Um, have you been involved in the Schofield project? Um, I I take it that wherever these um, facilities are being built by Vartzilla, um, there's a need for uh, programming uh, and grid inter integration um, and analytics. That's that's what you do. And tell me, what is it exactly? And what is the scope? And um, and whether you have any uh, contact with the, the Schofield project? We're certainly in contact with the Schofield project. Ascend is a 50 plus energy analytics company. And what we do is provide the analytic insight to support decision analysis, particularly as uh, companies go towards this transition of higher and higher renewables. In the case of Hawaii, uh, my company was one of the analytic firms Hawaii Electric reached out to to lead the integration effort towards 100% renewables in the resource plan. And the Schofield project was part of that plan and it was uh, evaluated in great detail. Is it fair to say that uh, in any significant project, when you have this, this kind of multiple multi-mode uh, system, as we have described, and as exists on uh, Schofield, you're going to need this kind of technology, the integration and analytical technology. In order to 
not understand uh, how to integrate all these renewables and have a, a reliable grid, you need to have an analytic lens. And that lens needs to be much more powerful in, in terms of how it looks into the future. And so your you know, old 35 millimeter lens needs to be replaced with a 300 millimeter lens. So you get the depth of field that you need to understand the intermittency and dynamics induced by all this wind and solar you're bringing on. And, we run the system, and as was mentioned, the Schofield project really serves as backup and to integrate under extreme conditions uh, where you simply can't charge batteries because it's not sunny enough and the wind isn't blowing. And you can't you know, make the island all batteries. That won't work either economically or uh, aesthetically. Uh, so you end up uh, using a little bit of renewable fuels uh, down the road today. It's, it's uh, existing conventional fuels in these uh, in the Schofield project. And it's a perfect resource to address that gap in the very infrequent periods that they occur uh, where you need to firm up the grid because there just isn't enough uh, natural uh, resources to produce the energy. Well, at the end of the day, you're going to make it more sustainable and more efficient. That's what it's about. Are you, are you doing projects all over the country? Uh, where, 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 are you, uh, where are you working? All the world, actually. <laughs> And everybody's getting on with this bandwagon of uh, let's go in renewables because the economics make sense and thermal generation these days are, are very limited. Uh, Ward Silla uniquely fits in and fits in the school field very ne neatly into this transition towards 100% because you need some backup thermal just in case, and it has to be highly flexible without a startup or shutdown cost, like your car engine. Conventional generation just doesn't move up fast enough. And it has too much cost. Uh, so when we look at minimizing costs for this uh, renewable future, typically we're finding more flexible resources like Wartzilla's have a role, albeit a small but important role uh, in this future. Yeah. So, uh, you see, let, let's uh, let's look at this in the larger context. The Schofield plant is a, it's a backup plant. And yes, we have covered it, uh, John. We have covered it here on ThinkTech. We've had we've had shows with uh, some of the people involved, including Hawaiian Electric, about that project uh, some some a year ago, maybe. And um, I was very impressed with it. But uh, where does it fit in the larger picture for Fartzilla's um, entry into the U.S. market it's, and its contribution to renewables in the U.S. market? It is, a, it is a perfect fit to that, uh, not only to the U.S., but the role of the plant is exactly what we see that will be the role of flexible generation in the, in the transition. And uh, even after the transition, you need this component in the power system to ensure security of supply. So globally, like uh, Gary said, many countries, nations, uh, states, regions, even companies have set already goals to decarbonize. There's always a year, 2040 or 50 or so involved. And today, many they are then figuring out how to get there. And we can see that uh, in this uh, path, you keep adding renewables and you have to that you want to use less and less fossil fuels on the way because that's where the carbon is, is coming from. And uh, then uh, during, uh, let's say, a sunny day in California, maybe you have heard of the duck curve that is there, uh, you, you would need to f switch off power plants because there is enough solar energy uh, for the system. But if you have these inflexible plants, large plants, you cannot switch them off for an hour or two. So you keep burning fossil fuels while you would otherwise have enough, enough uh, renewable clean energy. And that's the role of the flexibility during the transition to switch off immediately when you don't need to burn fossil fuels and come back when you need uh, uh, more energy to the system. Gradually, when you go closer to the totally decarbonized power system, you run less and less. And it is like uh, already here discussed that when the weather then behaves abnormal, let's say there's a rainy period a longer time and there's simply not coming enough energy from the solar solar and wind side then you produce uh, electricity with these plants and like our plants today they are capable of burning all the synthetic uh, carbon neutral fuels and we have announced in may this year that we will burn 100 percent hydrogen pure hydrogen in our engines soon uh, 
So we are working on that now in the laboratory conditions. And I think uh, hydrogen will also have a role in the in the power systems in the future. So yeah. thermal plants, they used to burn fossil fuels. People think the plants have to go, but uh, these plants can burn also fuels that do not produce any new carbon on, on the atmosphere. So then they basically have a new birth in a way. So is uh, converting uh, old fossil plants into uh, plants that use uh, more renewable type uh, liquid fuels? We can use both liquid and gas, gaseous mm -hmm. fuels and we can yes. convert, yes. Yes. Well, that would save a lot of money around the country for all these places that really cannot afford to, you know, just demolish the old plants and build everything new. But but one of the things that interests me, and, and John mentioned it, is that this is a backup plant here in Schofield. Um, it is not an online plant. It's it, You call upon it when you need it. But query, uh, let's assume for a moment that we get real serious uh, and we don't want to use the, uh, you know, the primary source, which is oil uh, here uh, for that area. Uh, and we want to populate the grid only with this kind of plant that you built in Schofield. So will this work as a primary source or does it have to be adapted to become a primary source? No, it would, it would surely work as a primary source. I think it is a question of cost. You can operate these plants as baseload plants or as a balancing plants for the renewables. So definitely it, it would work in both roles. It's up, up, up. If the decision is to be made <laughs> by you guys and what, what you prefer. I think uh, solar power today is very cost efficient. So uh, we should use it wherever you just have the physical location where you can put those panels and, and it makes a lot of sense. And when st storage, battery storage which is, uh, there's a strong learning curve still for the next 10 years at least on the cost of, of those uh, storage plants. So I think it makes a lot of sense to overbuild the solar and build storage and shift that daily uh, excess production for the next night. So this way you get a, a totally clean, clean system. And uh, then it is only to have a backup system for those weather conditions when you have cloud cover or you have some other reason, like some countries have something like winter where I come from, <laughs> at least originally. <laughs> and uh, Denver as well, as I saw earlier. <laughs> so so the, the, uh, the, of course you have solar cells, um, you have um, battery cells and you have this energy Engine that will burn any any number of different kinds of fuels and mixtures of fuels. Um, do you make the solar cells? Does Fratzilla make the, this this battery storage? Uh, you know, cells. Does it make the engine? Uh, or if not, where does it get these things from? <laughs> The engines are our own design from scratch. So we have been making engines since 1942, I think, uh, in, in Vertila. And uh, the solar panels or batteries we do not manufacture, but we are we are integrating uh, systems, then power systems, uh, power plants, uh, etc. To serve as balancing functions and even baseload plants. Uh, in Africa, we have had for many years in the sub-Saharan Africa, a market share of 80% of all power plants. So there's a lot of Vercel plants. You mentioned 50 countries. That's where the company has its own offices and, and locations. But actually, we have built power plants in more than 180 countries. Oh. So there is only, I think, 12 places the in the world, world where we have not. <laughs> Antarctica is one. Place. <laughs> Antarctica is one where we have <laughs> one, other, one other question I want to ask you is that, um, okay, these these engines, for example, just to take an example, are, are uh, built in uh, in Finland. And I guess, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have real quality steel and real quality oh, yes. uh, engineering. Um, but query, uh, they're, they're, they're metric. Um, and uh, I know that the army uh, at Schofield would, you know, was, would be very interested in resilience and sustainability. But if if a um, if if a piece went out uh, in that engineering in, the, in that engine um, and its metric, uh, how how would Varsella replace that, um, you know, uh, over the miles? You know, uh, the engine is metric, yes, but uh, we have 4,000 megawatts of these engines running here in the US only, and <laughs> okay. we have spare parts <laughs> available in several locations over here, so parts are available with immediate notice, so 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, metric right. or inches or <laughs> whatever you like. Yeah. Yeah. You... <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure that the army, uh, you know, the arm. This, this is a good project. It's a demonstration project, isn't it? Because the army is going to be very interested in sustainability and reliability and security and all that. And uh, they were happy with it. Hawaiian Electric was, obviously was happy with it. And uh, I think it's it's had very good press here. Matter of fact. Um, but query, what you know? What's uh, John? What's next in the pipeline? Do you know? Can you talk about other projects uh, that are contemplated around the country? Uh, can you talk about other projects that are contemplated in Hawaii? Yeah, well, there's one I think that's quite interesting. That's not too far from Hawaii, not in Hawaii, but it's in Southern California. Um, uh, it's it's a utility that, uh, like many in, in progressive areas, want to reach 100% renewables as soon as they can. But they also have a duty and a responsibility to make sure the grid is reliable. So they had a very old plant built uh, in the 1950s, which... Uh, was extremely unreliable. They've known for years it had to be replaced and they recently decided to replace it with um, a power plant comprised of battery storage and Bartzilla engines to back up the battery storage as well as all the solar power and wind coming off the grid from all over the state of California and the rest of the Western US. So it's, it's, it's another example, um, a newer example than Schofield is, um, of a utility that wants to get to 100% renewables, um, but in this case is in a very densely populated, one of the largest cities in, in the world, Los Angeles, and has uh, a, lot of, a lot of constraints in terms of space, in terms of people they have to serve and make sure they're not only green, but they're also very reliable. So that's a pretty exciting uh, project that we're working on right now. Uh, Gary Doris was also involved in that as a consultant to the utility there. Uh, it's the city of Glendale, California, uh, near, uh, near Hollywood. So um, that one has been, been pretty, pretty fun to work on lately. Gary, uh, you know, one thing we talked about, um, you know, reliability and security and all that. And, um, of course, in, in a world of um, computers, you, you're, you are the computer. You are the integrator. Uh, you are the computer that connects it all up, makes it happen. And you're, in that sense, uh, you're the one who has to worry about hacking, hacking from far away. I'm, I'm sure, for example, you, you could and do have, you know, computer internet control on these projects in some way to make sure they're functioning properly. Um, so query, uh, how, how secure are they? Uh, should we have any concern uh, about, uh, you know, nefarious activities uh, on, on the integration? Well, uh, my company's actually more involved in the decision analysis of what to build and when as they transition to these higher renewable standards. We are involved in operations as well, uh, but uh, in, in a different facet. Uh, security is a big thing, though, for the grid and is something that uh, electric utilities and system integrators and controllers are investing heavily in. And it, everybody has to be very vigilant about this. Uh, in terms of decision analysis, you know, what I think is interesting is both Hawaii and Glendale are faced with the decision. We want to go to renewables. We want to get there quickly. Why should we build this internal combustion engine? This sends us back in time. And it's not the case at all. It's a matter of efficiency and capital allocation to most economically improve the environment and reach these objectives. And Usi said it earlier, the price of storage is declining precipitously, and we're learning a lot. Uh, it's not a mature technology like an internal combustion engine. If an internal combustion engine can burn renewable fuels, frankly, that are created from the excess renewables when the sun's at its zenith angle, that's clean. It's a good use of that extra energy. Uh, you can't consume all the energy in batteries. So sometimes it's just too much. And so that's a way of taking advantage of the surplus and making clean fuels and then using these highly flexible internal combustion engines uh, to use them when you absolutely need them and the batteries aren't charged. And so when Hawaii was facing the choice of what do we do, their first choice was we need some flexible uh, internal combustion engines as backup 
to integrate all these renewables. Yeah, and Glendale's in the same spot. And it's really interesting to see, you know, how much more economic this is than any other choice. And we looked at this in a dollars per ton basis for carbon abatement. And it turns out it's an order, a couple orders of magnitude less expensive than any other solution. So it really makes sense. And if a municipality like Glendale or a, a private entity is interested in doing the right thing for the ratepayers and society, sometimes the, the choice, like these were slow engines, is the right one, even though it, it might sound like they're not headed down the road of green. That's actually not the case. Yeah. Usually we, we only have a few minutes left and I wanted to just talk to you about, you know, the vision. It seems to me that uh, Bratzilla is is in this all the way. It has committed um, to, to do clean energy, 100 percent renewable energy, not only, uh, you know, in the United States, but all over the world. And if you look at uh, the various parts of its website, you are you are impressed with the dedication that the company has uh, to making a better world, a world without without uh, greenhouse gases and carbon. Um, it's very impressive. But I, I just uh, wonder if you could talk about the future of Varzilla in the United States. Uh, what what do you plan? What what's what's do you expect will happen? Um, I know it's a lot of variables at play, but what what do you expect will happen in the next five ten years in terms of Varzilla's participation in our new green deal? I think that's a really good question. Let me first say that as part of the vision uh, that you mentioned first and that I spoke about earlier, we are part of a community called Path 200. So if you go to the website Path 200.org, you can see there those activities that are done there. This is we are doing. That's a kind of community where there's passionate people who want to help the world go faster towards the green, green future. So you asked about the U.S. I think it's a really good question. We see a lot of states already having set the target, RPS so and so by year so and so, and there's always a hundred percent or so number connected to a certain year in the future, we see quite a lot of utility companies, especially during the last year, lots, lots of companies have come out with a target of their own to decarbonize their portfolios. And we can see clearly that this is the time when guys like Gary are needed a lot because there's a lot of planning going on. I, I sometimes use the, the comparison that remember when JFK said that I want to take a man to the moon and bring him back alive during this decade. You needed some science to get them there and get them back, back as well. And I think this is what is going on right now. We are learning how to do it. And over the next five years, I think many people will learn how the, how to do it. Right now, it is still quite blurry, I would say, because these targets have been set very recently. But I think in the next five years, people will figure it out. And for us, we can see a lot happening on the storage side already. There's a lot of real projects uh, every week, something happening on the storage side. While may, I, we still need a few years, I think, before the market is ready for the total solution where these uh, flexible plants uh, are kind of replacing the inflexible infra gradually of the system and then becoming those plants that use less and less fossil fuels over the years and uh, later on the, then are converted to, to this uh, carbon neutral fuel. So we see a storage business happening and when these strategies come in place, new portfolio plans, etc., then we see a snowball effect coming also for the flexible mm. power plants. John and I talked about it, we just touched on it, but what, where, does, where does Hawaii fit in all this? Um, do you see Hawaii as a special place for green energy? I uh, see it as a special place for, you know, this kind of project, uh, um, this kind of combination of, of, of energy resources? If you ask me, I think uh, pretty, pretty much on top of the... Of, of the pack because you have set targets and guys like Gary have really modeled in depth how to do it, how to get there. So you, you have really already a plan. California is also moving very strongly forward, but the, the plan is still in the shaping. There's a lot of discussion of these fuels. You already 
shows that you have liquid uh, fuel, which is a bio-based fuel in the system. So it is already a solution for that. While now there's a lot of discussion whether it should be hydrogen or synthetic methane to put in the natural gas grid, etc. I think these things will be cleared out in the next next few years and then much faster movement towards the, the targets yeah. will start to happen. We'll all be watching. Gary, is there anything you want to add before we close? No, it's an exciting future, this transition to renewables. And I didn't think it occurred so quickly, but suddenly we see the cost of renewables is uh, outpacing thermal generation. And we need to figure out how to take advantage of these economic and clean opportunities. And some of this is taking advantage of the technological innovations. Uh, and John, anything you'd like to add before we close? Uh, well, I want to salute Hawaii for leading the country in reaching for high renewable goals. Um, a lot of people are following you now, and um, thanks for setting the example. And thanks for coming on the show. You see, Gary, John, really appreciate you being here. Uh, we've been hoping for this show for a long time. We are delighted to see you here and delighted to have this conversation. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>